Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Steve Kalari of Steve Kalari Custom Knives. You may know him as Super Steel Steve, the firebrand defending proper HRC, blade geometry, and USA manufacturing. But as a professional chef with a lifelong love and need for knives, it's exciting to see Steve put his money where his mouth is. He is now handmaking in the United States incredibly thin, slicey, handsome, and utilitarian kitchen knives in a number of different models. I have one right here. Just got it. Uh, I just received my eight inch uh, Steve Kalari custom chef's knife yesterday. Uh, as we record this, cut up an apple and diced an onion, and I'm already strategizing the excommunication of all my other kitchen knives. Of course, I am joking, but what isn't a joke is that only I and my wife will be permitted to use this knife. I look forward to catching up with this paisan and finding out what it's like taking a plunge into knife making. But before we do, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and hit the notification bell and download the show to your favorite podcast app. And as always, if you want to help support the show, you can do so by going to Patreon. Quickest way to get there is to go to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Again, that's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Steve, welcome to the show. How's it going, sir? I'm telling you, Bob, I'm going to get you to write my next resume because that might have been <laughs> the best introduction of me I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> cool. Well, the pleasure uh, is mine, sir. I want to congratulate you, <laughs> your mom's favorite knife maker. That might be true because I might be getting one for her. Um, <laughs> I was I was going to see if you're going to let that fly, fly, fly or not. I typed it in. <laughs> uh, I want to congratulate you on... Um, well, doing this thing and, and making a jump to actually making knives, these things that you love that you've been talking about for so long, uh, it's got to be a thrill. It is. It's a it's a big thrill. It um, It's something I wanted to do for a long time. I just the, the, the how do I say it's kind of the gate, the the barrier to entry to get into into knife making on any sort of like a legitimate level is obviously you need like a big old grinder, like a big old two by 72 is kind of the industry standard and they're very expensive and it's just, it was, didn't have the money basically. And I just, I, the, I got an opportunity to pick up a people, any knife maker will laugh at me with the grinder that I'm using, but it is a two by 72 and it does move a lot of metal. So once that, once I had the opportunity to get that for a really good deal, uh, a good friend of mine sold it to me. I just, I got two gears. I got park and seven and <laughs> So once I had that, I just went hog wild and was like, all right, I'm doing this. Okay. And by that, you're, you're, you're talking about your grinder uh, motor does not have a variable speed is what I'm assuming, uh, which makes it more yeah. difficult. And uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's a grizzly two by 72. So it's, it's just got, you know, one speed and that is uh, terrifying is the speed that it is. It just, <laughs> so it, yeah, it makes it obviously, uh, you can't, there's no, um, it's very hard to do very, uh, how do I say this? Like, you can, there's no nuance. I have to know exactly what I'm doing when I'm approaching the grinder because one mistake with a 50 grit belt moving at 3,600 RPMs is going to take a big old chunk of steel or handle material, out. especially doing handles. It's extremely nerve wracking because it's moving so quick. It generates a lot of heat. I can, I can burn the scales super easily. I mean, it takes less than a half a second to burn the scale when it's moving that quick, especially when you're eating the higher grit. So, it's it's uh yeah most if there's any knife makers that watch this they'll be laughing at me being like, <clears throat> he's using a, a grizzly it's kind of like a joke I learned amongst knife makers I didn't know that at the time I just he said hey I got this two by seventy two and I was like I'll take it but 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 hang on if if you're working on a substandard machine I'm throwing up air quotes uh, but you're still grinding steel that is this thin and making it paper thin behind the edge this is the knife I just received that I was talking about up front uh, doesn't that mean you're actually learning uh, with more resistance kind of like weight training the more resistance the stronger you get you have more resistance because you don't have this this super luxe machine to make these with and yet you're still generating uh super thin slicey knives yeah yeah that, i i it's like it's kind of a running joke uh, i talk about pops knife supply because they're local to me um 
so what, there's lots of knife makers in there. It's like, I guess the thing to do is like when you're, you go to a shop, everybody brings their work and they'll critique it and stuff like that. So I'm always handing my work to every, all the guys there and whatever knife makers are in there, just getting feedback. And it's always like, uh, they'll be looking at it. They'll be like, Oh wow, this is, you know, you know, this is good. And this is what I would do. And then it's like somebody will like holler from the back. He's got a grizzly. He's doing it on a grizzly. And they're like, you're doing this on a what? And they're like, oh, never mind. That's as good as you like. You know, it'll be like little detail things. They'll be telling me to like critique, and they're like, never mind. You wait, wait till you get another grinder because you know you're, you're already punching above your pay grade with, with what you have. Because I have that grinder. I've got a, an old used uh, Harbor Freight drill press and a uh, a super jerry rigged nine inch disc sander that is literally, I'm almost positive, an old uh, dish dish machine motor oh. hooked up to a disc sander with a belt that is bolted to a big piece of wood with door hinge door hinges. Um, that again, that doesn't even have an on and off switch. I have to hook it up to a power strip and turn it on and off like that. Oh. And that thing has, that thing just, it just rips. It's like, I use that to flatten, uh, like flattening scales and stuff like that. So I definitely have a super caveman setup for sure. But yeah, I like to think of it as, um, you know, like swinging a bat with a donut. Like if I can get, if I could put out really high quality work, with this, then once I start getting the better stuff, it'll be even better. That's my feeling. Like, uh, it's always easy, uh, no matter what pursuit. And I've done this a lot in my life to, to back away from some ambition because, uh, well, you, you use the term barrier for entry because the barrier for entry is too high. Oh, well, this camera's too expensive or, oh, well, this grinder's too expensive or it's too much of an investment to get into this thing. Well, you do that your whole life. You end up doing nothing. Exactly. If you don't, if you don't, and to, and for me, it's like, I have, if, like I said, when I have two speeds, I have park and seventh gear and I've had a love of knives and wanted to make knives. I didn't realize how much I would love making knives. that. I didn't know, but I wanted to do it, but if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. Right. And I realized very quickly with a little, you know, one by 30, I wasn't going to be able to do this as, as, as much as I wanted to, right. It was going to simple things were going to take too much time. And I don't have that kind of patience to sit there and like some of these life figures you see like Elisha Witz that are making these incredibly, you know, tiny or, or uh, what's his name uh, from black dragon forge. He's doing these crazy engravings on handles. Oh, yeah. um, um, I, I, I couldn't do stuff like that. Like I have to constantly see progress and see progress in myself in every knife that I make. So that would, that's why I just put it to the side. I made a couple blades for the YouTube channel. They were tiny just for testing and stuff. Then when this two by 72, I was like, okay, this is, I can do something. It, it might suck. There might be a, 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 I might have to, you know, it's caveman. I might have to, you know, really be good, really get good at it, but that's just work. That's just time and effort. And I've got, I've got that in, in spades. So I'm going to make it happen. Well, so the, the pursuit of, oh, first of all, have you always been a handy person? Because I mean, uh, someone who just comes in uh, with, uh, with equipment that might not be the best um, and, and you're trying to do something very hard with that material and you're doing a great job so far from what I can tell from my knife. Uh, have you always been handy? Is this something that you kind of easily transition to? Um, I don't know if I'd say I was handy. I mean, being a chef, I've always worked with my, I, I don't know. I, I definitely, I, I get it a lot that I, progress very very fast with knife making i think it's just i don't know i kind of got a knack for i don't know I, making knives and cooking are real similar to me um i mean it's 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 time it's temperature and it's uh it's some nuance with your hands so i i don't i don't i wouldn't say i'm like a super handy guy like i mean i'll fix you know i can fix things around the house and i, I usually can figure stuff out fairly easy I, I think one of my biggest strengths has always been i can i can learn you know i've always been a good learner i can learn if i if i that and i'm uh, I am, I am to a fault. I will always outwork everyone around me. That, that's how my cooking career was. I couldn't afford to go to college. So I was like, okay, well, I can't go to, can't afford to go to culinary school. So I'm just going to outwork every single human being around me. And that's how I'm going to, I'm going to get good at this. And that's just what I did. And it's the same with this. It's like, I don't have good equipment. Okay. Well, I'm just going to, I'm just going to do this till three o'clock in the morning. You know, when I wake up at five for work, I'm going to do this till three in the morning, every single day for four months straight <laughs> until I can start putting out things that look like I want them to look. So, you know, when I, when I was asking handy, I think what I more meant was artistic because cooking is definitely an artistic pursuit. Um, you know, when it's a job or a career, maybe less so, 
But the point is you're making something for enjoyment and for sustenance and you're making it from nothing or you're making it from raw ingredients and you're kind of doing the same thing with knife making. Um, are you are you still a chef and and or does knife making kind of take the place of that creative uh, need? Uh, it, it more than takes the place for I, I'm telling you, I can't ex explain. I don't know who I was talking about this. I, I did not know I would fall in love with making knives as much as I did. Um, I've been doing um, I, I've been doing sporadic private gigs and, and caterings and stuff like that. But I've been in food sales for the last three years um, outside of the kitchen. And this I, uh, I probably enjoy I enjoy making knives even more than I enjoy cooking. To be honest, like I didn't realize I would enjoy the process, the see, giving like once I give it to somebody and hearing their experience um, as much as I, I do. I really didn't think that would that would happen. I'm being honest. Yeah. You make me a dish and I'll eat it and be like, my God, Steve, this was delicious. But two weeks from now, I'm not going to be saying, man, that steak was I mean, yeah. I might. I might. But this I'll be, you know, I'll have this for a lifetime and then or the rest of my lifetime and then my girls will take it one of them they'll probably fight over it like uh but the point is like you you get return on this over and over and over you get to hear about how great your creation is but also you get to know that it's um you know doing someone solid for their cooking and you know providing for their family yeah that's a because that's who i had in mind like i remember was like it was like the line cook is who i had in mind because i remember when i got my first really good knife how it sounds corny, but how much more professional I felt, right? Mm -hmm. Like I had a really, like this was a really high performance piece of, you know, tool and I'm going to use it like that. And then it's funny, like you say that because it's, it's like a, a like a, now that you're saying it, I'm, I didn't think about it like that, but it is like a double-edged sword. It's like with cooking, you're, you're there for the moment. You're trying to, when you do like fine dining, like I did, you're trying to be, you're almost trying to be unnoticed, right? You're trying to, you're trying to provide an experience where people almost don't even know that they're in your restaurant. They kind of forget where they are and the food's amazing and the service is great. And then they walk out and go, Oh my God, that food was amazing. And then it goes away. Whereas a knife it's, it, it gets to be in someone's home. It, like part of running a restaurant. is amazing. Especially fine dining restaurant is I'm part of people's memories. Mm -hmm. And I used to tell my staff this all the time. Like you don't know what first dates are going on in here that might lead to a marriage. You don't know what birthdays, what 75th anniversary, you don't know any of this stuff. So you, we got to be perfect every time because we could screw up someone's anniversary. We could screw up a marriage proposal. We could screw something up. We can't do that. And with making knives, it's kind of that same vein because those knives are going to cut a birthday cake. They're going to make someone's first dish for a girl he likes. They're going to, you know, they're going to you know, cut hot dogs for their kid for the first, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but also on the flip side, if we do screw up in the restaurant, well, at the end of the night, when the restaurant closes, it's a new day. If I screw somebody's knife up, <laughs> they've, yeah. they've got their perception forever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And and the and the knife is there every day after work when I come home and I have to cook, you know. And yep. there there's a, there isn't for especially for someone like myself who's just obsessed and always has been with knives. There's a there's a joy beyond. Wow, this thing cuts so great. I don't even have to think about it. Um, you know, it's it. There will be the the little flash of joy. Oh, you know. Uh, of knowing this is my first custom knife. This is my first really good kitchen knife. I have a, a Vustov Trident that I love. I have a, um, I have some shuns that I have tweaked to love, you know, um, <laughs> but Hate this, this, this is the, uh, you know, this is, this is the thing. And it's, um, uh, well, it's very special to me. And last night I, I cooked, I, I, I diced an onion in a way uh, that I've never been able to do before. You know, you, you know how you do the, this way and then that way. Yeah. The horizontal um, cuts, yeah. Yeah, the horizontal and the and the vertical cuts to to dice. Well, um, I've never used a knife so thin that I could just swipe through it. I always have to kind of lightly saw through it, uh, you know, so that I don't go all the way through and cut my fingers. This I could just. And I'm sorry for those listening. Uh, I'm 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 me I'm mimicking uh, <laughs> just just swiping the blade horizontally through the onion instead of having to gently saw through it, you know. And I, that sounds like nothing but i've always watched chefs do that as a matter of fact i watched you do it in a video where you released cutting uh without an edge on one of your knives and that's how you were doing it i was like i want to cut an onion like that and this is so damn thin uh, at the spine and so sharp it slips through it like it's not even there it's funny i joke around i tell people you know my knives are like pf flyers right they're guaranteed to make a guy cut faster and better. And I'm, but there is a little bit of truth to that. It's, you know, how the knife there's technique you learn 
uh, when you're cooking uh, professionally, obviously, but yeah, it, you, you need, I can't do that with a, with a super thick knife. I can't sit there and, and slam through an onion super quick like that. The only way I can slam through an onion really quick is if the knife will let me slam through the knife really or slam through the onion really quick. <clears throat> so that's, you know, like I said, there's a little bit of truth behind that. If you get a knife that's, that's ground well, right. And, and ground to be a performance-based knife, then yeah, you can cut things a lot quicker. Um, and, and people don't realize that when you get a really good kitchen knife, like I remember my first experience with mine and you go to cut an onion and it just, we call it ghosting. It just goes through, it just drops through it. You're like, what is that? And then you just yeah. start looking for stuff to cut. Cause you're like, Oh, I want to, yeah. I want to keep that feeling going, you know, like that, that effortlessness when it just, like you said, it just zips right through the side. You're like, did that even go through? And you're like holding the onion up. You're like, Oh my yeah. God, it did. This is also one of those knives where when you cut yourself, you're like, did I cut myself? And then it takes a second and then it yawns open and bleeds. And then you feel the pain, you know, it's a, it, <laughs> that, that yeah. the, the, uh, the feedback takes a while. Cause it's, it's thin. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about your process, uh, especially considering um, your past in in the knife world. You have been, I mentioned up front that you've been a bit of a firebrand for maintaining quality in things like heat treat um, and, and holding people's, uh, holding companies' feet to the fire about that. Heat treat, um, geometry you talk about a lot or have spoken about a lot in the past. And then also manufacturing in the United States. Obviously, you've got that part down. Uh, but in terms of, um, you know, ensuring that these things that are so important to you when you were kind of reviewing knives and talk, talking more about um, production knives and knives on the market and that kind of thing, uh, what what kind of steps do you go through to make sure that your heat treat is great? And uh, tell me about that learning process because you're going from um, the user side to the maker side, uh, but with very strong ideas. So how are you, what are you doing? Um, so like I said, knife making, like the chemistry of knife making and like heat treating and stuff just always came very uh, natural to me. I understood it really well. Um, chemistry has always been something that I enjoyed and cooking is a lot is, all chemistry. So uh, probably one of the reasons why I got along with, I tell, I joke around all the time, tell people like I was your favorite knife makers, favorite YouTube guy, because I know a lot of these knife makers because they would come up to me and they, they DM me or I'd meet at Blade Show and we'd start talking and stuff because they, they resonated with a lot of stuff points that I was making and they agreed with a lot of it. Um, so going into it, it I, I knew what I wanted to accomplish. I knew how to accomplish it. It just, I went through a lot of, and I still go through, like I have a, um, I'm making some knives out of a big circular saw blade that I purchased. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of testing going on right now to how to heat treat it. Cause I don't know what it is. Like last night I took it, put an edge on it, hammered it through some nails to see how it would react. Then I shattered it and looked at the grain, realized that the grain's not quite what I want it to be. So I got to do some further thermocycling, the grain refinement stuff. So I just, yeah, I knew the process of it. The trick was obviously I don't have the funds uh, right now to have a, a proper heat treat kiln. So I had to use a forge. So then I had to figure out how can I, how can I execute what I want to execute in again, another caveman situation, right? I don't have a good grinder. I don't have a proper oven. So how can I do this? So it, it, it took a lot of uh, taking heat treat recipes and then figuring out ways really it's with heat treat. It's getting your, I made a post about this, getting your temperatures correct. And the problem with most guys, most guys that heat treat in a forge are like they're forgers. Like I forge knives as well. And they're more old school guys and they kind of have that mentality because there wasn't, and it's not their fault. There wasn't any information back when they started. You take whatever steel it is, whatever carbon steel, you heat it to non-magnetic, you quench it in canola oil or whatever in it, and it will get hard. And out, actually I encourage everyone to, uh, outdoors 55 to go watch his video. He did a video a couple months ago about heat treat and it was, he did three knives exactly the same and did a proper heat treat, a kind of screwed up heat treat and a completely screwed up heat treat. And he demonstrated some really surprising results. Um, and a lot of times with, with crap heat treats, you, don't even, you won't even notice it as long as the rock well is where it should be, right? Where the, as far as edge retention. Yeah. In, tough, in toughness testing, though, you notice a significant difference. Now, I don't, like I said, I got park and seventh gear. So if I, I'm going to do anything, I'm going to do it to the max. And like you said, I talk a lot of shit. I talk a ton of it and have for a lot of years. So... I know if I'm going to come out, I have to come out correct, right? Because there's people going to put my stuff under a microscope. Sure. And, and again, that's, I'm the type of person that that kind of pressure uh, elevates me. 
So I did this in cooking. Like everyone can go on Yelp and hammer me about my food. My name's on the menu, same exact thing. So I, I wasn't foreign to it. So what I did is I went out and I got, um, I bought some, what they're called temple sticks. And these are basically like, uh, it's like a crayon. It looks like a piece of chalk basically in different colors. Uh, and they're using, they've been around for, I don't know, hundred years. They're industrial uh, temperature gauges basically. And what they do is you can buy them in every temperature from hundred degrees to like 2,500 degrees. And if you buy one for 500 degrees, that crayon will not melt on the surface until it hits 500 degrees. Oh, cool. So I have them in 1400, 1450, 1515, 1500, 1650, 1700, every temp that I need. Um, so I can get, so what happens is, is so most of the time when I'm, let's say we're normalizing the steel, I'm looking for 1600 degrees. Um, what I would do is I, I have my, my knife in the forge and I start going as I, and I do everything at night first off. So with all mm -hmm. the lights off out in my garage, so I can see the temperature and, and it's not even so much the temperature I'm looking for. It's the shades. I, what I'm trying to make sure is I'm getting an even color because um, I don't, some guys go by the color of the steel. I notice the color of the steel, but I'm using the, te the temple sticks. So that's more important. It's more accurate. They're accurate within, I think like two degrees. So I'm looking at night to see, make sure that whole piece of steel is all evenly, where am I? All evenly orange. There's no dark spots anywhere. Once I start getting it, once it gets a cherry red, I know we're getting coming close to non-magnetic, which is about 1400 degrees. I have a, mag a magnet, a big industrial magnet on the side of my forge. I start tapping it on that magnet. Once it reaches non-magnetic, I know I'm around 1400 degrees. Then it's, I got the crayon on the other hand. Then it's a matter of in the forge for a few seconds, run, and I run the crayon from the tip of the knife. You see, I've got the knife right here. I'll run it from the tip of the knife all the way back here. And back in, back in until I get, let's say I'm normalizing, let's say it's 1600 degrees. Once that crayon melts from here to here, the whole length of the knife, there we go. Then it gets hung up and it lets the air cool for normalization. Then when we're doing oscillatizing, where we're going to quench the seal and make it hard, same process. Let's say I'm doing 1550. I've got the 1550 crayon. Same thing. Wait till it's at room temp. We go back in. Once we're at non-magnetic, then it's every few seconds. We're checking. We're checking. Once it hits across and we're at 1550, I give it a quick pass in and then into the oil it goes. And then another extremely important part that nobody ever talks about is the time it goes from quench to cryo to, well, I use dry ice, so it's not technically cryo, but from quench to cryo to temper. And that's another, that's a reason why I think we have a lot of like most production heat treats aren't the best is because they don't, and why most custom, any custom knife maker that cares at all uh, at what they're doing, just the, feet and the mere fact that they're taking it from the quench to the temper in a, in a very short amount of time has a huge impact on how the steel reacts because it's, it's a, it's a chemical reaction you're, you're causing in the steel. So the time that it goes from quench, I'll have it in the oil. It'll come out, usually comes out at about 150 to 200 degrees. I take the oil off, then it goes straight into the, into the cryo. It's in there for an hour and then it goes straight from the cryo into my oven here to temper. So uh, I'm, uh, I'm sorry. I got two questions. Uh, one normalizing that's normalizing the grain. Is that what's happening? Uh, the grain structure that first yeah part. kind of so yeah so what normalizing is doing is now this is more important on a forge knife but i do it with all my knives i think it's important and particularly because i heat treat in a forge uh ideally if you're using a heat treat oven um and you have precise temperature control you'd want to anneal the steel have it in an anneal state a spiritized state because then you can play with how hard you want to make it the hardness the out of the oven hardness out of quench hardness with how hot it is right with a forge because i don't have that temperature range, what I want to do is I want to normalize it. So normalizing is we're taking it to a temperature where the carbon diffuses into solution and kind of everything gets normalized. If there's any stresses in the steel, they get relieved. And that happens usually around 1600 degrees, depends on the steel. And then what it's also doing is I'm allowing it to cool at, in still air. And because it's a longer cool or a slow, a quicker cooling process than annealing, it will turn from an anneal state, which is how I buy the steel to what's mm -hmm. called a perlite state. Perlite is harder a harder state technically than an annealed state um and it's a different it's a very almost almost looks like bacteria these long strands is how the steel will look um and that will allow me to when i when i oscillatize also give me maximum hardness on it. um i actually learned this technique from laren thomas dr laren thomas it's in his book oh. and, he's, and he's done videos on it so um a lot of the stuff that i that uh, that's my bible i've had that book since i started and i think i've read it cover to cover twice now um, so I, I defer to him. He's done a couple of videos on that. And uh, that's where I, I got that technique. And I ran through probably a dozen knives 
using that technique. Um, and then again, I'm fortunate pops will poke a knife for me and then I have it verified over there to the Rockwell hardness. That is so cool. That, that, that makes it even cooler <laughs> to me. I mean, a, that you were following a, a recipe from his book because yeah, he is the guy to defer to. Right. And, um, but also knowing I, I didn't, I obviously didn't know the process that this went through. I, I made the assumption that you sent it to someone to have it professionally heat treated so that, you know, but that's awesome. That is awesome because you're blending the old school with the new school. I mean, you're, you're really, um, well, I mean, you said caveman, but really it's, um, it's a little more MacGyver in a way because <laughs> it's, it's, it's a little MacGyver. Yeah. You got the knowledge and you got the process and, and, and you got the outcome. That's the important part. You could use a fancier machine when you can afford it. And maybe that's a quicker way to do it. But for now you're doing it in a way it's been done forever. Uh, let me ask you this. Um, uh, the cryo part, does that bring it down to a regular room temperature? So then you can like, what's the, cry how does the cryo fit in? Uh, I so, just got a knife in the mail today that boasts cryo. And I want to yeah. know what that means. So cryo, cryo is technically liquid nitrogen, right? And what you, what the pro, so the process, this is the way I understood it and talking to Laren, it, 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 it's, it's how it works. So when you're trying, when you take a steel that's annealed or soft and we're going to make it hard. So we're taking it, you have to take it to a certain austenitizing temp. Technically that is once the steel becomes non-magnetic, it's changed from ferrite to austenitite and it loses its magnetism, right? Now each steel above that, usually you have to go above that. There's a certain temperature where the, everything, um, where the carbon diffuses and everything starts going where it needs to be. I'm trying to not get too geeky on this, but once technically once it hits non-magnetic and you were, if you quench it fast enough, depending on the steel, whatever it may require water, oil, slow oil, um, you're, you're dropping the temperature. There's a thing called the TCC curve, which is how quickly the steel has to cool from say 1500 degrees to 800 degrees in order for that process to happen. Mm -hmm. Cryo is furthering that. So what happens is when you take a steel up to its austenitizing temp and then you quench it in oil, right? It drops down, boom, from 1500, let's say to 800 degrees. That steel, you've, in, you've initiated that change and everything starts changing and locking up and the steel starts getting harder. Matter of fact, if you take the steel out of the oil, let's say it's still 500 degrees and you start running a file over it, it'll still feel soft. And if you continue to do that, you can literally feel the steel getting harder because the process has been enacted. Yeah, so cryo, now when you, when you quench a blade, um, not all of the austenitite converts. When, when you quench a blade, you're converting it to martensite. That's the hard stuff that the steel is, is in a state now. Not all of it gets converted, right? Usually it's in the ballpark of 90%. So what we're trying to do with cryo is keep that temperature drop continuing. And this is what a lot of people don't understand. That's why you get a lot of production knives that claim they're cryo. How fast you, you go from the quench to the cryo makes all the difference on whether the cryo does anything at all. Mm. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to keep that temperature moving. So you're going from 1500 degrees, boom, we quench right at 800 degrees. Now it's still cooling in the oil. You take it out. Now we're going to take it down from room temperature to below zero. So liquid nitrogen will take the steel down to like, I think negative 327 degrees. Wow. I don't have access to liquid nitrogen. So what I do is the next best thing is I take um, either denatured or 91% isopropyl alcohol. And then I dump a bunch of dry ice in that. And it makes a, when I use my temp gun, it's usually like negative 100, 101, somewhere around there. And then we submerge. So again, knife goes from 15, 800, comes out of the oil, let's say 200 degrees, still coming down, goes from 200 degrees right into negative 100 degree uh, cryo, you know, dry ice, a liquid dry ice basically. And then we continue to drop it down to, you know, about a negative 80, 100 degrees. We keep it there. All the data I've seen from Laird and everyone else has been, Usually about 30 minutes to an hour is where the effect maxes out once that happens. So as we're continuing to keep that steel cooling, more retain all the austenitite, the retained austenitite, that 90%, we, we convert more of it into martensite. So what you end up getting is you end up getting, um, you can increase the rock roll hardness by a, anywhere from half a point to a point, depending on the steel. A lot of stainless steel is almost requ not require it, but it does a lot better. So I'm, that's why I'm trying to get 8670 is a steel that doesn't get super hard. So hitting 63 is actually what I, what that knife is at is actually fairly difficult. I got, I have to do that cryo to get it to, to pop 63, getting it to 61, 62 is not a problem, but getting it to 63 and above is like, 
of kind of pulling molars at that point. Mm-hmm. So I'm forcing it to do that. Um, and then obviously like with your, every batch that I do, I have, them. Uh, I have one out of every five poked and then usually one out of every batch. Unfortunately I have to snap in half and look at the grain and uh, take a look at it. But it always makes you, I, I feel bad doing it. And then I look at the grain and I get happy and then I feel good about it. So that's cool. Cause you're seeing how uniform the grain is. And, um, uh, and when you say poke, you mean put on the, uh, the Rockwell tester, right? That, that, poke. Yep. um, uh, so with a, with a, for a knife in your experience, um, uh, in the kitchen for a chef's knife, do you want uh, a higher Rockwell, um, uh, what is the, cause I'm always seeing, you know, people on the steel, I'm always, uh, running mine over a strop and always keeping it honed. But if you're a professional, uh, chef or cook and you're just, man, you're, you're using it all day long and it, do you want to hire uh, Rockwell? Absolutely. So, uh, I get a lot of guys asking me about like when I'm going to do super steels and stuff like that for kitchen knives and I will, mm-hmm. uh, probably for fun, but when you're dealing with a, with a kitchen knife, right? Produce and meat are not abrasive materials. So all the edge retention that you get from um, all the edge wear you get from a knife, is it impacting and sliding across that cutting board, Mm -hmm. which is usually wood or poly polyurethane. It's not Mm -hmm. a very abrasive material. So you get 95% of your edge retention on a, on a kitchen knife through what sharpening angle you have it at um, and how hard it is. Basically is, is it the harder the steel is the longer the edge is going to last. Um, Cause it's not like you're cutting through cardboard, like with an EDC knife where you'd need like uh, where vanadium or certain carbides. I, my favorite knife that my first big chef knife was made out of Rex 45 actually. Oh. And the only reason I didn't get that because there's any carbide, I got that because it was at 65 Rockwell and it was the hardest knife I could afford at the time. <laughs> um, Cause the Sukunaris were like 700 bucks. So, um, and that knife would last me on a fresh edge, like a week in a professional kitchen without actually having to touch that. Um, like strop it or put it on like a diamond steel or something like that. So, so you do so, want higher hardness. So on a chef's knife, you might want a thinner behind the edge geometry, but a more obtuse actual edge. Uh, does that make sense? Is that right? Yeah. It, well, it depends. So it depends on how thin the knife is. So, and it depends how the knife's ground. So you could take like that knife, for instance, the knives that I send out, I keep those at about 20 degrees per side only because it's, five thousandths behind the edge yeah. so once you get to that kind of behind the edge geometry geometry the, the you saw i cut it i cut the onion when it was dull right so yeah. when you get to that point um it doesn't you you would benefit i'm sure but um the 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 like not the risk to reward ratio i'm looking for the roi on making it thinner behind like the edge thinner isn't really worth it to me it's not to make it put a 15 degree edge or versus a 20 degree edge on a thing that's as thin as a sheet of paper it's kind of like would you even notice it at that point? Because the geometry is you're going to go through that, whatever you're cutting, regardless, you know, when you have a thicker ground knife, then yeah, absolutely. The thicker the knife is ground, the more the edge geometry is going to uh, play a role. That's why if you see like traditional Japanese knives, they're single bevel. Yeah. Now they're single bevel because instead of having, let's say two 15 degree edges, right? You have one 15 degree edge, which means it's 15 degrees total. Yes. So that's why the knife and, it, and those knives tend to get thicker pretty quick, but because that, angle of attack is so narrow they just drop through food very very quickly right right and they and they seem to like um make the food peel off in a certain way that's efficient for cutting uh when it's that sort of when it's that sort of chisel so i i uh when i was in college i worked uh the pantry position uh, uh at an italian restaurant for uh two two summers so only about six months in total working in a professional kitchen but it was a lot of fun and um uh, we had four sets of knives, uh, on, on things around the wall on those, uh, um, magnetic bars. Magnetic strips. Yeah. yeah. And then a company would come and sharpen them every week. And then people would rush to their favorite, you know, uh, type of knife. And, and the yeah. funny thing is, uh, they, they came very broad cause they just sharpened the crap out of them. Uh, so the blades were very broad. It's also nice cause you could scoop up a lot of, uh, ingredients on them to move, yep. uh, to move it around. But, um, I just remember looking at them. They had, uh, now that I know something about knives that I didn't back then, they had very high relief edges, you know, the cutting edge. It was just looked like hollows. Just... Yeah. Yeah. It, those things, uh, man, it was. Uh, Cozini. Cozini. What's that? Cozini. Cozini's C O Z Z I N I. Cozini's the company 
They're the black handle. They look almost like Victorinoxes, like uh, fiber oxes. Yes, yes exactly. And they, and, they have a, and they have about an inch tall hollow ground, like 36 grit ground <laughs> bevel on them, right? Yeah. Yeah, and then, and then every you, you could watch them. They would start off about this tall, and then when you wanted a fillet knife, all it was was one of those knives that was six months old <laughs> that they had ground into a fillet knife. Yeah, I, I love it. Yep. It's, but it's so ham-fisted. So do you find um, – it, it, did you find in your professional career that uh, people who are really devoted to the craft would would show up with something more special? Yeah, well, you'd be surprised how many professional chefs don't carry good knives, like especially the old school ones. Now you see it a lot more. A lot of the younger guys are hip to it. A lot of the, uh, the younger guys are uh, are into knives. So now you see a ton more. The last, like I'd say, like eight years or so, eight ten years. Now you see guys showing up and. Guys have like yeah, like Chef Knives to Go and and um, MTC Kitchen. Those those distributors, guys know who they are. Guys show up because now they take it. Now cooking's cool, right? Like cooking's like a thing. Like it got this because of Food Network. Everybody wanted to be a chef, so guys are all into and, and the girls in the kitchen. They're all into like having good knives now. So yeah, you definitely see the guys now. They still don't know how to sharpen them half the time, which is <laughs> which is funny. But um, back when I first started, like you know, over fifteen years ago, like guys would look at me and they're like, what is that? You know, they're like, yeah, that's peach scratch too thin. It's going to break, you know? And they, they would look at you like you were stupid for spending 200 bucks on a knife. They, you know, they're like, Oh, this thing does just fine. You know? And they, you know, they uh, destroy whatever they were cutting. Right. Right. So but yeah, it's like, uh, it's funny. Uh, anytime I've ever eaten goat, I always say it, it seems like it's butchered with a hammer. Uh, that that's a totally, uh, uh, I don't know, non sequitur, but that just reminded <laughs> me. Um, but when you're, um, when you're in the kitchen using knives like this, um, uh, like a, a professional kitchen, I, I would imagine they are coveted. It's like hands off my knife. It's like not something that you're just kind of grabbing around for tools. Uh, I'm going to keep this PC, but there is a saying it's like touch, touch my knife. You're touching my, my Johnson is how it is in the kitchen, in professional kitchen. <laughs> you don't touch, which is weird because there's a lot of like really, uh, I'm not even going to get into it. Yeah. Questionable activities that happen in a professional kitchen, but sure. guys, yeah, they, yeah, they take their, cause, because you always like, not every one of the, you get the, especially in the States, we have not the most savory individuals that work in kitchens. Not everybody's like a, like a career mm -hmm. chef who wants to be one. So you end up with a lot of guys who might have idle hands and yeah. things like tend to walk off, you know, and then you never see the guy again, um, which is weird. Cause you're like, what are you even going to do with it? So yeah, people are very protective about, uh, there's, because there's also usually guys in there that have no idea about your knife and they will grab your knife and they'll go try to, you know, they'll take your 5,000th ground edge knife and go try to spatch cock a chicken with it. And then you come back and the edge is all looking sawtooth and you're like, oh man. Well, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then you're like ready to smack them with it. Or do that thing where they'd uh, open up big cans with this part of the blade. <laughs> oh, I've seen it. Oh yeah. Quack, quack, quack. Oh yeah. 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 Th those are the guys that that's why those are the guys that look at you when you have this like really well ground knife to cut that are like, cause they look at it like, like a non knife person looks at a, um, uh, like a pocket knife. Like I always say, if you want to see how tough an, a pocket knife is, give it to someone who's not a knife person, like your wife, and yeah, you'll yeah. get that thing in all kinds. I mean, they'll, they'll use that thing to pry things and poke things you've never even dreamed of. Cause they just don't know any better. Those guys that would open the back of a number 10 can with the, with the butt end of a knife. Yeah. yeah. Those are the guys that would look at you like you're crazy for carrying a knife that actually that cuts things. So before you started making them, uh, and when you were in the kitchen uh, every day, what what knives did you use? I saw your tattoo says Wustoff. Or, or was that? Oh, your, that that was that? the first set I bought. Yeah, that was the first set I bought. The Wustoff tattoo was when I got my my first sous chef job. I beat out. I, it was like a. I showed up and it was almost like chop style. I got there. There were two other dudes, um, and they had like you know a, a cutting board with like a chicken breast carrot celery onion and then they were like okay uh you guys have an hour to make me uh, a dish or whatever you want basically you have an hour it was like chop style you can use anything in the kitchen so we were all like running around and i beat the two guys out for it and that was like the moment where i was like okay i'm gonna like i can do this like i can do this as a career so the wustoff thing was more of like what the company represented because they've been around for 200 plus years like consistency um precision you know, longevity, things that I thought were important in a chef. You know, I, I also didn't like, I thought the guys that would get like the, the corny, uh, like pig tattoos on their arm or whatever, like that looked like a butcher block. 
Uh, so it said, it said I got a really corny, stupid Gustav tattoo, but I thought at the time that it was cooler than, than the, the stupid, you know, butchered, the butchered pig tattoo that everybody was getting. Um, the knives I prefer were all, and you can see it in, in my knives, they were all Japanese. Once I learned about Japanese knives and the difference, um, Chef Knives to Go was the first website I ever went to that, like, my head just exploded. And I was like, what are these? Um, and fortunately, they have, you know, they have a forum on there. And they're always, they love when professionals get on there. They have a lot of pass arounds, but they'll pass, the, the owner will send knives around to get tested before he puts them on the site. And other guys will, and there's a lot of guys on there, professionals too, that'll do, pa a lot of people do pass arounds because they're, it's the knife community. It's another section. They're all super yeah. generous. Everybody's super nice with their time and their stuff. So I would get in on these pass arounds because I was a professional. There wasn't too many professionals on the site. So I was a professional. So guys would always want me to try out the knives. So I got the chance to test, you know, dozens and dozens of these different makers and i was like i'm looking at some of these knives that were you know cheaper than a shun but were hand made in japan that were just i mean i, I were amazing and i was like well this is this is the way to go you know so that was you know my first and i still have the knife my daily driver for like almost 10 years straight was a was a kohetsu uh 240 so like a 10 inch uh half 40 uh chef knife that was my wife actually got it for me that was actually like a big deal. That was like a, uh, it was like game changer. It was like, it was clad. And it was this tool steel. It was 65 rock I was like, Oh my God, this thing's going to cut for seven lifetimes. It was ground super thin. Was it uh, the, the French chef's knife shape or did it? The no, it's not, it's, uh, it's, it's not a Sabatier. I don't have it up here. It's, it's more, it's more, it's more Gyoto style like this right here. This was actually a gift. This is a, a my hobby, but. It's more, it was very similar shape to this okay. kind of a lower set point, lower yeah. rocker. Oh man. That's so with the, uh, okay, I remember, hang on, before I ask you this next question, I remember being obsessed with trying to find this one Japanese chef's knife. This was years ago. It was for uh, a girl I wanted to get it for, but uh, never found it, but I had seen it somewhere and it, it was a big, long 10 inch chef's knife and it had these um, oval holes in it. Almost looked like a, a a chef's knife and a cheese knife had a Galeshin. What's that? Galeshin. The brand's Galeshin. G L E S S I N. Galeshin. Yeah, they have these huge. What do you call them? Not. Um, I can't think of the name. There's a name for them, but they're these huge scooped out divots. Yes. In the blade. Yeah. And, and they, they're there to reduce uh, stickage. That's what I thought was so cool. I, I guess it re reduces surface area, so you just chop, and your cucumber's not sticking to your thing. It's just kind of falling off. Uh, I always thought that was cool. Um, since you were talking about Japanese knives, I had to bring that up. But uh, in terms of your knives, have you gotten them in the hands of any uh, professionals who are in, in the kitchen right now um, testing them out? Or how do you test them? Um, what kind of things do you put them through and that kind of thing? So, so that's the first thing I did. So the first three prototypes that I made, I kept one. And then obviously I have friends that are, I have a bunch of friends that are professional chefs that own restaurants. And I gave, I gave three of them to friends and I, with my exact instructions were just beat the ever loving dog crap out of these until they break and then tell me what happens. And they haven't broken them yet. Um, I go, I see them in the kitchens usually once a, once a week or once every two weeks. And now they're all patina. And ma matter of fact, two of the knives that I sent out in two of the kitchens, one of my buddies, he also has a catering business. And he uses the knife exclusively himself. The other two, it's, it's, you know, like you were talking about the black handled knives on the magnet. Yeah. Yeah. My knife is one of those now. So it's, it's not just being used by a chef. It's getting used by every degenerate in that kitchen. I mean, it, it's just like, I see it in there. Like I looked over and I saw it on the magnet and I saw some guy walk over that I, I'd never seen in the kitchen before. And he's got it. It's sitting in like lemon juice. I don't know what he was cutting. <laughs> so that's, well, that's a, that, yeah. So that's, I did that. And then obviously me being a chef for so many years, I know, I, I know because how do I say this designing a knife for a professional kitchen is a little bit different than if it's going to someone's home. Mm -hmm. And when I am selling to a chef, I do um, like the tip geometry, like particularly up top, I still grind behind the edge, very thin, but I try to keep more thickness towards the tip because that tip, these things end up on cutting boards and they slide and they will be like stainless steel uh, tins and yeah, yeah. matter of fact matter of fact uh one of the guys uh, the chef that i uh up in pennsylvania just sent me a picture and he he got the tip knocked right off his right here that i just made him because uh the cutting boards those long cutting boards there are these little like clips kind of things that where that keep it from sliding 
Mm-hmm. And there's a gap and that little clip, his knife went under it like this and somebody hit it and knocked the very tip of it like that off. So I got him sending that back. So I'm going to regrind that back and swedge that tip out and make it a little bit tougher. But so what I would do in my kitchen and stuff like that, I would, I mean, people sound crazy, but I, before I ever put a knife out, I would grind it down to five thousandths and I would smack it into the side of a steel mug or, or a, I, you acquire, you acquire uh, restaurant bowls and third pans and sure. hotel pans over the years, they magically find their way in your house. Yeah. So I have stuff like that. So I would take the knife and I would just smack it into the side of a pan and then I would grind it to 10 pounds, smack it in the side of the pan. That's one of the reasons I chose to use 8670 is because it's in, in according to Laird's chart, it's a 10 out of 10 toughness. Oh. So it's, a, it's tougher than three V it's tougher than four V it's up there with Z tough. Uh, it's, it's, and, and 50, uh, 51, 60. So it's extremely tough stuff. So it went through my mind was this would be a perfect steel. If I could get this steel hard enough, that combination of strength with toughness would give really, really good edge stability to a thin ground knife. And then I could hand it, put it in the hands of a, of a professional chef and not have to worry about it. You know, big chunks getting taken out of it bar. They don't do anything crazy, but, right, right. um, you know, like hack a ham bone in half or something. And you'd be surprised how many people try to do that. Um, so yeah, I, I, I sent, I sent them out to them and let them use them for about two months before I put a knife out. And then I did my own testing here at the house. Like I said, I just, just testing the limits of it, seeing how far it could go doing stuff like leaving it. This sounds weird, but I would literally leave it on the edge of the table like this. And I'd walk by and smack it with my hand. So it would back into the side of a, of a, uh, of a container. Cause that's what happens. Stuff like that happens all the time. I would drop them on the floor. I, I would, I would sit there, grind the tip nice and thin, and then literally knock it off onto my tile floor. And see what would happen when it would bounce off the floor, because that's how tips get busted all the time. Yeah. So, I, you know, so that's how I would sit there and, and I would get an idea of it, at this rock well, at this heat treat, and this geometry. This is what I can expect from it. Um, and that's again why my main line is with this eighty six seventy because I've had these things. The first time it happened, I actually was some handles were getting glued up, and I had them out here on my counter because it was too cold outside. And I woke up the next morning, and the knives were on the floor because the cat decided to walk by and just smack them all off the counter in the middle of the night. Uh, and I was like, well, the handles didn't pop off, which is good. Cause I don't even know if they were dry yet at that point. And uh, none of the edges, <laughs> none of the edges got popped. The tips little, got popped off. The little bastard did you a favor. <laughs> uh, yeah. At first I was mad. I walk, I wake up and I look and I'm like, you gotta be kidding. Me. Cause they're glued up now. Right. Like we're, we're on the home stretch. He's about to yeah. go out the door. And I'm like, he's gotta be joking. And, and the blades as I'm blowing them and stuff, once the blades done, I tape them with tape so they don't get scratched. So then I had to like, like, you know, when you like stub your toe real bad and you don't want to take your shoe off because you don't eat, it feels like it's broke, but you don't want to even look at it or you scrape your knee under your jeans when you're a kid. And it's like, I, I didn't want to take that tape off and like see what was on it. So I had to sit there and like cut it off gently. And I'm like, oh, thank God. I'm three, I'm two for three. Okay. Oh, okay. We're good. You know, stuff like that. So yeah, I just beat the crap out of them. Just- yeah. You don't, you don't want to take that tape off and see just the shards of narsil on your oh, that's what i thought like i feel it and i'm like oh, maybe it's there maybe it is like and i'm already in my head thinking okay how fast can i get this done because i told this guy it's going to be out the next day you know so but again it, it it's just i know what goes and i also know what goes on in it in a regular house because yeah. despite what a lot of people think my wife is not like does not think like a professional chef she leaves stuff with food all over it she'll throw stuff in the sink and leave it wet she'll do all kinds of stuff to carbon knives. You know what I mean? Like she doesn't pay attention, doesn't care. You know, I mean, she cares about what I'm doing here, but like, as far as knife maintenance, that's not something on her list of priorities when she's cooking dinner or something. So I let stuff like that happen. I let her use it. I watch what she does with it. I don't tell anybody to be careful with it. I just let them use it. If something busts, then I know, you know, that's the only way to figure it out is to push it as far as I can and then get an idea of, okay, is this reasonable or is it like, like, do I need to make it softer do I need to you know, temper the seal down? Do I need to grind it thicker and, and so forth? All right. Well, uh, up front, I, I indicated how precious I was going to be with this. Only me and my wife. But you know what? My, uh, my 12-year-old daughter is showing an interest in cooking. I think she just cooked everyone uh, a meal upstairs. Uh, so maybe actually uh, hearing, hearing what these go through and hearing how, how you've sort of tested them and made sure they're worthy um maybe i'll let her have a crack at it i'm just worried about it we have a stupid knife block and all but one of the slots 
are too short. So if you drop a long knife in there, it hits the, hits the bottom. Yeah. <laughs> and, exactly. and I'm, I'm afraid that's going to happen because no one else in this house cares as much as I do. Uh, but maybe actually uh, it'd be better for her to know as she's coming out of the gate what a good knife feels like. Uh, you know, I would enc- I would encourage, and if she busts a tip off, just send it to me. I'll fix it, and we'll she'll you'll never know. We'll we'll, okay. we'll make it all we'll make it better. It'll be easy. So ju- just to reiterate, uh, eighty six seventy, which is this deal. Um, okay, so so basically to sum up, uh, it's super super tough, but you can also get a super uh, high Rockwell hardness on it, which is seems to be the perfect uh, set uh, of um, qualities you want out of the big three for a kitchen knife. Hundred percent. Like I said, I'd never even heard of this stuff. Which, for me, a guy who's been in the steel, is saying a lot. Like I never heard about it until I walked into Pops, the knife supply store, and they were just like raving about it. it it's just the best carbon steel you could use for anything. And I'm like, yeah. okay, okay, how much is it? Like, I thought it was like super expensive. And no, matter of fact, they cut a deal when you buy this stuff. Like that, you won't find. It's their house steel. They call it their house steel. They sell that for the best price that you could find anywhere, right? They, they, they want people to use it. This is one of the reasons I love those guys so much is because they, 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 they use everything and they promote what they think is actually the best, not what they can sell you. So I was like, okay, let me give it a shot. And when I started looking and I looked through Laren's book and I saw that and I was like, huh, now granted, the harder steel gets, the less tough it gets. But at 63 Rockwell, that's the toughest steel you're going to find at that Rockwell, if that makes any sense. Yeah. So when, you know, we want edge stability with an edge, right? We, edge stability is the edge not chipping or rolling. Well, that's kind of like the, in my opinion, that's the combination of strength and hardness and toughness kind of meeting its, its perfect spot. And to me, 8670 does it better than so far anything I've tried. Hey, W2, ADCRV is a good a close second. Um, 1084, 1085. God, I can't remember. I've tested a bunch of steels, and that does it better than. Uh, and it also adds a lot of ductility to the steel, um, a lot of flex. Like I've I messed around the other day, and I ground a knife down to two thousands, two thousand, and not just oh. not just not just two thousands at the end. This is another thing I want. If you you can look at it on your knife, th- you can grind a knife to five thousands like this, or five thousands like this. Yeah. Okay. So when I grind the knife, I'm focusing on grinding it thin all the way so if you could take a caliper and measure that knife up uh i want to say quarter inch quarter inch up the blade and it won't be it shouldn't be higher than twenty thousands. so i want the whole knife to be thin so when you ground a knife to two thousands right and then it's like you know ten thousands up here i mean i could literally flex it like it would cover my fingernail like i could it would the whole thing and then i would sit i was sitting there on the counter on the corner and just flexing it to see when it would finally bust and I got it like 60 degrees before it finally popped. So if, you, if, you, if I take this knife and gently, um, you know, roll it over the edge. Do it, yeah. Yeah, 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 right yeah. You'll yeah, see you, yeah, you can see this light, light little. I mean, I don't want to do it flex. too hard, but you can see that flex. And that, I mean, that to me is really impressive. You mentioned pops a couple of times uh, when I was talking to um, Andy Roy of Fiddlehead Forge. He, he was talking about pops but that, that's uh, got to be an amazing place that's down in georgia right yeah so andy fiddle by forge he's one of the owners of, oh, of pops okay okay he, he him uh dirk lutz uh joey berry and alan i was missing his last name it's with the w those are the four professional knife makers that own pops knife supply that's cool uh so a little shout out uh to pops i've just heard such great things about them but i guess one of them <laughs> was from the one of the owners but still i've heard I've heard uh, them being mentioned before. So uh, I, I want to find out, I want you to tell people what they can get, first of all, how they can order a knife from you, and then what their options are. Uh, this is not the only thing you make. And uh, if you, uh, you got to st- uh, follow Steve Kalari Custom Knives on Instagram, and you'll, you'll, you'll see the different things. Uh, but describe the different models you make. So I've got a 10-inch chef's knife an eight inch chef's knife like Bob has a seven inch Santoku, which is a very popular style. You see a lot. It's got a very um, sheep's footy style blade to it. Mm-hmm. More, more drop in the tip than a, than a chef's knife. Uh, a six and a half inch Nikiri. And Nikiri is a cleaver style blade. Um, that's technically it specializes in chopping vegetables. 
A uh, lot of women tend to love that knife. A um, lot of dudes too, but for some reason, women love the Nakiri. It doesn't have a technical point because it's squared. Um, I don't make mine like a traditional Nakiri where it's dead straight across. I put some belly in it. Uh, I, you get better chopping and better uh, rocking that way. And then I also have a four-inch pairing knife uh, that that I that I'm very proud of. Making it making a good pairing knife was a making the perfect pairing knife is literally one of my life's missions in knife making because they're all done so poorly. Um, but yeah, I got a four inch pairing knife and I actually just finished up a six and a half inch bunk, which is, do you know, they call them K tipped chef knives. You ever seen one of those, a Kripta curry? It's got oh. a K tip to it, like a reverse tanto. Yes, yes, yes. The uh, bunk is just a shortened version of that. So it's got a K tip on it. Um, and it's like a, so it's like a six inch chef's knife with a reverse tanto. Basically. Oh, cool. I turned my uh, my shun ten inch into one of those because I dropped it and broke the tip. I was like, oh, See, make it now it looks cool. Uh, so this is cool. Uh, the um, what you were talking about your pairing knife, uh, making uh, the perfect pairing knife as a life's mission. What it's funny. I kind of have always intuitively thought, geez, man, why is it every pairing knife I have sucks? But what? Why? Well, it, it's funny. Like you can Google chef knife, right? And like if you took all the silhouettes of chef knives. They're all going to look fairly similar. If you take all the slicers, all the, you know, all the uh, butcher, boning, breaking knife, you take all these in the silhouettes and they have a shape. If you Google pairing knife and took the, the silhouettes, they're all different. They're different lengths. They're different handle sizes, different thicknesses, different thick. Everything is, is, is different on them. And I think the reason for that is, is because, and then you also have like, in my the most hated knife, the knife that I hate the most, the redheaded stepchild of the knife block, the utility knife. Like it's like a six inch long thin knife that serves no purpose because it's too thin to use on the cutting board and it's too long to use in your hand. A pairing knife is to pair, which means in hand, like peeling an apple, that's pairing. When you're pairing something, you pair a tree, you trim. So a pairing knife should be an in-hand knife, right? You should be able to use it in hand. Now, most people don't do that. They'll like cut the crust off bread and stuff like that. They use it for everything because it's little. As somebody who had to use a pairing knife coming from traditional French fine dining, you pair, you pair a lot of stuff. For instance, there's a cut called a tournée that nobody even knows about because nobody does it anymore. But it's a cut that it's, you shape up, let's say, a potato. It looks like a football about an inch and a half long, and it has seven, not six and not eight, seven sides that you have to turn, you have to turn in your hand like this. I used to have to do 1500 a day okay, for service. 1500. I had the worst carpal tunnel you can imagine. I used to have to dunk my hands in ice water to get them to stop swelling as I would do it. Um, so I know what a good pairing knife feels like. And one of the reasons I would get that carpal tunnel is because my pairing knife was so thin, you know, having to, where's the camera, having to grip like this over and over and over again. So I developed the pairing knife instead of doing three inches, like it should be. I know in my head, again, what my wife, what other people's, families use a pairing knife for and a lot of it they cut on the board with as well they'll cut stuff with them. so i made it four inches i made it a little taller and then i kept the background and i added belly to it and i kept it about an inch and a quarter so in i have a very average size hand it's about three and three quarters across so when i hold the knife i think i've got it right here here's an old prototype here's a prototype for it mm. don't mind it's all it's a prototype but so this belly right here so when it's in my hand, it, see, I can turn it like yeah. this and yeah. it fits. Come here. There we go. This doesn't get exhausting. So what I do, I sat there and I peeled a dozen apples with this. Thing. Nice. So I peeled a dozen apples. Then I peeled a dozen potatoes with it. Then I peeled onions with it. And, and I kept doing it to see, because the less flexion in your hand that you have to do with this, the less tired your hand's going to get, right? So, and then, like I said, I gave it height. So you can do, you can cut on a board like so. So if I don't cut myself, mm -hmm. um, my wife's been beating it up. So it's probably dull. Um, so there you go. Yeah, this is, but this is the beginning. This is, I'm going to forever be tweaking this until it becomes the perfect pairing knife because there's never a good pairing knife. That is, that is funny because I agree, but I never really thought about it. But now that you mention it, I agree. Um, and also I remember seeing your pairing knives in your uh, Instagram feed and also not really consciously, but now that you mention it, noting the, the interesting dimensions of the handle or different different looking dimensions of the handle. And I think thinking uh, that it reminded me a little bit of an oyster shucking knife a little bit, because I think oyster shucking knives have have larger, more teardrop handles because you're exerting a lot of force. Um, 
Uh, exactly, Matt, you're doing this over and over again. Yeah. Now, now I feel I I I need a paring knife, but I'm I'm gonna first bond with this one. Uh, but man, I I I like that. Uh, I like that it's part of your mission, you know, to to uh, I don't know to fill that gap because if you feel it, uh, no doubt many many other uh, professionals and uh, and cooks out there uh, have you know experienced that too and feel the same way. Um, before we close, I want you to let us know a how people can um, order from you and B that these are two unrelated questions, but tell me how people can order from you and B where you want this all to go. Um, first off, anybody wants to order from me, just go to my Instagram right there and, uh, just DM me. Um, and also for the record, I make all of knives. I've got a, I make choppers. I make hunting knives. I make all kinds of just kitchen cutlery in particular is my love. And that's what I have like a set line for. But if you have any knife, I actually have a line of EDC knives that are going to come out. I'm doing a collaboration with uh, a guy by the name of Lynch, Justin Lynch of Lynch Leather. Oh. But um, if you, like I said, I'm just saying that. So if, if you have any interest in hitting me up for any knife, custom knife to be made, I do that. But go to my Instagram, uh, Steve Kalari Customs or Steve Kalari Customs 2. I have two of them because um, Instagram likes to, to turn stuff off if you don't say the right thing sometimes. So I have two. Um, and where I, where I plan on this going, I plan on being a full-time knife maker. That's exactly where I plan on going with this. Like I said, I've got two gears park and seven and i don't i don't do anything half-assed and i like i said i i love doing this more than i ever thought i would and i plan on doing this for as long as i can right on steve thank you so much for coming back on the show i really appreciate it and uh if you're a patron of the show you can you can catch a few more minutes of conversation with Steve uh, after the fact. Steve, thanks so much. Um, uh, best uh, best wishes with this venture. I love this knife and I really look forward to bonding with it over time and showing off the patina after a short period of time. Uh, thanks for having me on, man. And cut some cut some hot meat with it. It'll turn, it'll get blue patina. It'll be real pretty. Ooh, okay. Oh, that's a great excuse for steak tonight. There you go. Cut steak with it and you'll see a really pretty like blue and purple patina it'll get. Oh, nice. All righty, sir. Have a good one. You too. Thank you. Thanks. Don't take dull for an answer. It's the Knife Junkie's favorite sign-off phrase, and now you can get that tagline on a variety of merchandise, like a t-shirt, sweatshirt, hoodie, long-sleeve tee, and more, even on coasters, tote bags, a coffee mug, water bottle, and stickers. Let everyone know that you're a Knife Junkie and that you don't take dull for an answer. Get yours at thenifejunkie.com slash dull and shop for all of your Knife Junkies merchandise at thenifejunkie.com slash shop. There he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Steve Kalari. I'm really excited about my new knife, as you may have gathered. Um, but I'm also really excited to see uh, when people take that next step, especially passionate people like Steve, who's been uh, into knives for so long and using them professionally. Well, now he's returning the favor and getting great creative joy out of it. So, Steve, congratulations. and. Uh, Man, I'm really looking forward to digging into that steak tonight. All right. Join us again for another great episode, a uh, great interview conversation uh, next week on Sunday. Of course, there's the midweek supplemental on Wednesday and then Thursday Night Knives, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, right here on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. Until next time, I'm Bob DeMarco saying for Jim, working his magic behind the switcher, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, thenifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on thenifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at thenifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at thenifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Podcast.